Okay, I'm going to share my screen. So just bear with me. Okay. So over the part over the last 13 years, I've developed an endurance running art practice as part of a larger inquiry into the performative nature of human physical activity in the interplay between the body and technology. The runs I undertake are performed in specific places along predetermined routes and are mediated to an audience live through mobile technology that is enabled to track my journey as it is taking place and to relay images of my viewpoint and location. To develop an art practice using long distance running has enabled me to work with concepts of endurance through engaging with an activity that by its nature is self-governed solitary and physically demanding. I'm not good at running and running definitely does not come naturally to me. Running, particularly long distance running, is something I find particularly difficult and challenging. It hurts, it makes me feel vulnerable and weak, but it also makes me feel attuned to my senses and to the limits of my body. I have to think about my heart rate, about breathing, about pace, about hydration, about food, about energy, about injury, about not falling over. In this sense, I find running a fundamentally human activity. I'm not interested in competition, nor am I interested in achieving a personal best, but I am interested in the continuous tension it holds for me between success and failure. More importantly, it is for me about being in the present mo moment. Not, not working. So I'm just trying to forward my slide. Let's see, let me just. Why is my not, slide not going moving? Let me just. I uh, might need to stop sharing for now and then reshare. Apologies for that. Um, I'll reshare and see what's happening there. Just bear with me. It might be because it's on. Um, Okay, bear with me. Technical glitches. <laughs> so, um, I'll go back into it. Okay, it's stopped at a, a, an okay point because I was just going to the next bit. Okay. Right. So, on the 31st of May this year began the artwork and run Thames Run Source to Sea as part of the associated programme for the Estuary 2021 Festival organised by Metal. The work was a live artwork and durational run that took place over a continuous period of 14 days, from the 31st of May to the 13th of June 2021, and followed the trajectory of the River Thames from its source in Kemble, Gloucestershire, to where it meets the sea at the Isle of Grain in Kent. The route was split into 14 sections, starting at 10am each day, Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, I was unable to pre-book hotels in time as I had initially planned. So I hired a camper van, here he is, and persuaded my partner to accompany me as my assistant and driver. His job was to drive to each location I had identified as my stopping point each day and to check into the campsites and other places we were eventually able to book and to stay in overnight. The use of mobile and internet technologies were at the heart of the work and key to the dissemination of the artwork as a live event. Each day, I announced my journey for the, uh, for the day using social media. Audience are able to, audiences are able to track my movements online using GPS tracking app, the GPS tracking, tracking app, Locata Web, which enabled them to see the development of my journey in real time as it was taking place through the, the live movement of a red line at each mile, I stopped to take a photograph in the direction of the river and uploaded it. These acted as mile markers for the journey. Can everyone see the slides? I can see them. Can someone tell me if they can see the slides? Because I have no idea otherwise. Well, we are still on the one with the shoes and the, okay. and the pants. Okay, sorry about that, because um, it's moving for me, so there's another 
technical um, situation. I'll try and really sharing again. Yeah, you know, if you can if you can tell me if the slides are moving, um, then I'll know. Um, sorry, um, I'll restart sharing again. Um, okay, share again. Okay, well, I should share the one I'm at. It might be to do with bandwidth again. So people can turn their videos off. It might help the situation. Thank you. So um, can you just check for me if this is um, moving? Is this moving? It's, it's moving, Veronique, but there's still no sound. No sound now? Yeah. You can't hear me? I can hear you. Oh, no, well, I haven't switched the sound on yet. OK, no problem. OK. So the sound doesn't come to a little bit later. So I just want to know the slides are moving. OK, thank you. So apologies for that. So I'll, I'll carry on for where I left off. Um, so in addition, I tested the capabilities of Facebook Live and live streamed my, as much of my journey as I could from my mobile phone, attached to a harness worn on my body. I also, um, has this changed? I also wrote a blog entry, should be an image of a blog entry, as a means of remembering what I'd taken, um, what I'd taken, what had taken place each day. It would be impossible to recreate um, this um, as it happened, as it was a live event. What I've done for this talk um, and what I'll be doing is to read extracts from the daily entries I wrote to give you a sense of the whole narrative of the journey. Um, accompanying this will be a short animation made from the 245 mile marker photographs I took during the journey. With some of the sound um, I've added to them, I recorded during the run. This will be repeating on a loop as I talk, so we'll see it several times. Okay, and I have a, just printed out on a scroll to read from. <laughs> okay. Right, and the sound doesn't start just yet, just so in case. <laughs> um, I'm writing this the night before the start of this epic, Sunday the 30th of May 2021, the night before the start of the run. I'm writing this the night before the start of the run of this epic journey along the length of the Thames. I'm feeling a mixture of apprehension, nervousness and excitement, as I always do when I start these projects. But this one, over a period of 14 consecutive days, is the longest by far, so it has a sense of the unknown and this is what drives me. We picked up our trusty high-end camper van, Nolan, from Stoke Newington this afternoon. He'll be home for the next 14 days until I complete the run. Where I've been able to, I've booked ourselves into campsites en route, mainly for security, comfort and hygiene. Just before dinner, we took a stroll along the path through some meadows just off the busy A429 to the stone that is said to mark the source at Trewsby Mead, which has a just about legible inscription the conservators of the River Thames, 1856 to 1974. This stone was placed here to mark the source of the River Thames. It is, of course, a disputed source, and other accounts place the true source um, 11 miles further north at Seven Springs at the source of the River Churn. However, this is also identified as a tributary of the Thames, so it's difficult to say with any authority that it is a truer source than the official, more popularly known one that we saw this evening. It was a beautiful, warm summer, summer evening, quite a change from the relentless rain from a week ago. Let's hope this bodes well for the next 14 days. I can't expect it to stay dry for all of that time, and I'm prepared for all weathers, but I hope there'll be some balance in the weather. I hope it won't be too hot either. Monday the 31st of May 2021, day one, Thames Meads Castle Eaton. I'm writing this having survived the first of 14 days running, feeling tired and a bit sick from what turned out to be 17.5 miles instead of the 16.5 I had planned. Yeah. After initial delay due to a later than planned breakfast and some technical hitches, <laughs> um, the run itself began relatively easily through typically English pasture-like meadows strewn with buttercups. It was still quite cool and a light breeze and slightly overcast at around 10.45 so I started at a fairly even pace, heading southeast towards Ewan. The river was not visible to begin with, so I had to trust the Thames path signs. 
These, it turned out, were to be invaluable as markers throughout the route. Soon the effects of the last couple of weeks of relentless rain were apparent from the first patches of thick mud and shady areas I still had not had a chance, that still had not had a chance to dry, and later in the waterlogged fields where the river, still shallow, had burst its low-lying banks. The first of these came about three miles in, shortly after bypassing the village of Ewan. It was a case of either wading in mid-calf or turning back, and I wasn't going to do the latter. The second was, a much fur was much further on, after I'd woven my way through the beautiful lakes that are part of a nature reserve, starting at some of the Keynes, four or five miles in, and ending around 11 miles, not far from the Saxon town of Quicklay. Initially, I proceeded as I'd done before, expecting more or less the same experience before I re uh, reached what was much deeper than I thought. It looked too dangerous to venture across. Eventually, I found a somewhat shallower but wider stretch of water, which looked more or less possible to venture through, but not without some caution. I was relieved to get through, but frustrated that this had added time to what it would take to complete today's run. By now the afternoon heat was on, which would make the stretch to Castle Eaton more difficult. Apart from the difficulty of the task and the inevitable pain and stiffness that temporarily comes with it, the pleasure of running through, through and experiencing this English landscape in the way I did today is something I would not trade. I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Tuesday the 1st of June 2021, day two, Castle Eaton to Tadpole Bridge. If yesterday's steam was excess water and today's was excess cows, the route out of Castle Eaton was straightforward. The first mile in the bit bypasses the river and the signs are not so frequent. So I wasn't clear which path I should take, but luckily a man with a, walking a dog saw me in the right direction. It wasn't too long before I was back by the Thames, which had now appeared to narrow, but it was only for less than a mile before I was diverted again around two farms. It was at one of these that I had my first encounter with a large herd of cows, as I tried to follow the edge of the field where it seemed to be adjoining the river. I found myself cornered at the far edge, not wanting to move for fear of being trampled upon. I had to wait until they'd all passed for what seemed like an incredibly long time. It must have only been about 15 or 20 minutes. The route stayed very close to the river for the rest of the journey, and I was pretty much on my own for the next few miles until I reached Letchlade, where the Riverside Park was a popular place to be in today's warm weather. It was great to see people out and about, but I prefer it when I'm alone. When running alone, I feel privileged to be immersed in this landscape and to experience the river in its late spring glory, with everything that comes with that in terms of wildlife. You're very aware of every sound that you never hear or see when you live in a big city like London. It was difficult to fully appreciate these in the growing heat of the sun. Much of the soft ground from the last few weeks' rain had already dried up in yesterday's sun, so it's quite hard going and uneven underfoot. There is very little shade for much of the journey, and by mile 12 it had become a real struggle. However, there were a few pleasurable moments when the breeze picked up and I could feel it on my skin as I was running. When I saw a sign at Radcock for another four miles to Tadpole Bridge, it seemed like I would never get here. I was pleased when I finally reached Rushy Lock a short distance away, although the road that led to it seemed like an eternity. Wednesday, 2nd of June 2021, day three, Tadpole Bridge to Oxford. It was already very hot when I set off at 10 o'clock from Tadpole Bridge. Although the route was directly beside the river, there was little shelter from the blazing sun. I felt pretty much recovered from the day before, with only a slight stiffness in my legs. However, the dry and even ground soon started to weigh heavily underfoot. Due to the heat, I found myself taking more frequent sips from the sweet liquid inside the bladder sack in my trail running bag which kept me hydrated, but really wasn't refreshing at all. I made steady progress to the halfway point at Bablock High, where there's a caravan park on the banks of the Thames, and the official Thames path makes a detour around it. I'd hoped to find a way through the park when I saw a sign that clearly said, this is not the route for the Thames path. Normally this might not have deterred me, but I was mindful that we were still living under COVID restrictions. Given I was on my longest run yet, I also didn't want to get so far only to be made to turn back. I gritted my teeth and followed the official path. 
This took me along a road with into some fields with sheep and young lambs, so there was some pleasure in the process. But it would be almost two miles before I could rejoin the River Thames. Here it meanders quite a bit before reaching Pink Hill Lock, where I had to cross over to the other side of the river. It continued to wind its way via a short diversion onto the B4044 until a glamping site at Swinniford greeted me, with signs saying 3.5 miles to Godstow and 5 miles to Oxford. In normal circumstances, these distances wouldn't have seemed so far, but in the relentless heat of the day, they seemed almost insurmountable. This last stretch was the busiest, with many people enjoying the heat, both inside and out of the water. I really wanted to join them, but ploughed relentlessly on. I was really struggling by the time I approached Oxford, and I knew that the nearest stop point for the campsite was another good couple of miles away. I saw a bridge ahead, which I remembered from the campsite address. I decided this would be where I would stop for the day, as I'd already reached 21 miles. Thursday, 3rd of June, 2021, day four, Oxford to Clifton Hamden. Today's run couldn't have been more different from yesterday's. It's amazing what a combination of cooler weather, more shade and easier ground can do. For the first mile and a half, I was making up for lost ground after finishing short of my intended stop point yesterday. This part was easy going on a level, smooth path, so it didn't take too long. I was also in a better frame of mind to appreciate the distinctive Oxford University College Boat Club buildings on the other side of the river, despite the sense of privilege they connote. This section coming out of Oxford kept me close to the edge of the river, through very green areas, nature reserves and meadows, and even onto and through a kind of island close to Sandford-on-Thames. Back on the riverbank proper, the path continued as part of the Oxford Greenbelt Way, so more green paths and meadows to run through. These were surprisingly soft and not too uneven, so they felt relatively easy to run on. A few small bridges here and there made it possible to cross over to small tributaries. It wasn't until the halfway at around mile seven that there was a short detour around a boating community and through some woods that took me to Abington Lock, where I had to cross over to the other side. Initially, this was quite open, with people enjoying river activities and the still warmth of the day and glimpses of sunshine. It felt muggy, but an intermittent soft breeze and a less direct sun made the run feel all the more manageable. By mile 10, I was heading for Cullum and on the home straight. I knew I'd be crossing under a railway bridge at about mile 12, and from there, there would only be a couple of miles to my destination. Just before that, I'd seen a signpost indicating three miles to Cliff and Hamden. But as usual, when you're approaching the end of the run, it always seems further than it is. The path continued close to the river through more green space, where it was set back a little from the river to give space to the shrubs and plants growing on its banks. Reaching Clifton Lock around 13.5 miles told me I wasn't far from my destination. In fact, the beautiful bridge at Clifton Hampton sat on my horizon line and guided me to the end of the run. Friday, 4th of June, 2021, day five, Clifton Hampton to Goring and Streetly. It's always difficult to dress for the rain, especially if you're wearing various gadgets on your body. The temperature had cooled somewhat, and I have a light waterproof trail running jacket that's breathable, so I figured it wouldn't get hot with only a light t-shirt underneath it, and it offered me the best protection. The first two miles or so were quite easy. The paths were quite soft on grassy land and kept close to the river's edge. Just before mile three, I had to cross a lock to the other side, which continued along grassy banks for about a mile and a half, until I had to divert up to a busy road just after mile four until Shillingford. The path continued for the next couple of miles through glady tracks and back close to the river, before there was another diversion close to a marina, marina and waterfront cafe. It was a little confusing, but I managed to find my way through and back to the river, across the spectacular Benson Lock, which took me to the other side again. This is about halfway. The route kept close to the river again for the next mile onto Wallingford, where another diversion took me inland. There seemed to be no good reason for this, other than this is clearly a well-to-do town with large houses bordering the river, and whose owners won't allow public access. The diversion, however, did take me past a very old church, which I believe has some significance. I was soon by the river again, 
the rain had softened the ground, which made it much easier to run on as I started to tire. I saw a sign from Moulsford, only a couple of miles from my destination. Much of this park runs through Cholsey Nature Reserve. What I'd forgotten was that once past this, there would be another diversion. First around the perimeter of Moulsford Prep School, and then again around some large properties that think they own the part of the Thames their property adjo adjoins. The last section, thankfully, um, was close to the river. I spotted Goring Rowing Club on the other side, but it was a good mile and a half for another, another diversion around a lock before I reached the bridge that separates Goring and Streetly from one another. I could have stopped as I came out onto Streetly High Street, but decided to cross the double bridge that takes you into Goring, where the Thames path continues. This will be my starting point tomorrow. Saturday 5th of June 2021, day 6, Goring and Streetly to Henley. Today was another long stretch. The first part of the bridge at Goring had led me through shaded paths immediately next to the river for almost three miles. But there was a detour inland at River Lane Plantation, which sound, sounds uneasily colonial and suggests it's some kind of farm. Although this was frustrating, it took me through some woods, which was unpleasant and provided much needed shade. Which was pleasant, sorry, not unpleasant, <laughs> and provided much needed shade. This terrain was quite undulating, with steep slopes and mountain bike and, my, and steep slopes that mountain bikers would enjoy. I decided I didn't want to waste too much en energy this this early trying to rock up, run up them, so I walked up them and ran down. As I neared neared Whitch Whitchurch on Thames, I noticed a long fence bordering the blocked-off area, reinforcing the fact that this was not to be entered. To rejoin the river, the path went through the main street where it crossed the bridge over to Pangbourne. It was a bit confusing to find where the path continued. I took a guess at Pangbourne Meadows, which had joined the river in the right direction. This was quite open for a couple of miles until Maple Durham, where there was another diversion inland. I tried to find an alternative route closer to the river, but the marina, railway and housing developments blocked a possible route through. This detour seemed to go on forever. Eventually, a path in a private wood took me back down to the river and followed the railway line to Tilehurst and to the north edge of Reading. By now, I was nearing 12 miles and past halfway. The next stretch went through the Thames Valley Park Nature Reserve, which is beautifully green and borders Caversham and the red grey Pinsett rowing lakes on the other side, although I couldn't see that far. A recreation park was full of activities I approached Sonning, where I had to cross over the beautiful double bridge at Sonning Mill to the other side. I saw a sign for three miles to Ship Lake, close to my destination, and I was impressed to see Ship Lake School allow access right by the river. I had almost reached Ship Lake itself around a new section of the park that takes you much closer to the river, when I realised I hadn't been paying attention to the mobile phone on my left arm. That is my live tracker, and its battery was nearly drained. After much frustration and swearing, I realised I could run the tracker from the same mobile phone I was using to live stream from Facebook. This somewhat distracted me from the last part of the run. I was diverted back inland to Shiplake to avoid the railway, and then back to, and then at the back of some grand houses in the Bolney Estate. It was a short stretch through more green fields and an amazing double bridge crossing, crossing at Marsh Lock and weir before I reached Henley. This is distinctive in the flow of people in the park that leads onto the main uh, path to the bridge. Tomorrow, I'm pleased to say, will be a shorter run. Sunday the 6th of June 2021, day 7, Henley to Cookham. I enjoyed the first few miles out of Henley that kept close to the river. I was keep competing somewhat with rowing trainers on bikes coming towards me shouting instructions through megaphones to rowers across the river. At about mile three, there was a diversion inland. I continued through the village of Aston, where the road seemed to get longer and steeper. This didn't seem right, but with nothing to tell me otherwise, I continued. I asked a passing cyclist who confirmed I'd bypass the turning. He also mentioned that the path went through private land and that the landowner didn't like the public using it. As I wound my way back down the road, there was no Thames Path sign to be seen until I turned into what looked like a private driveway with a blue sign for a cricket club. 
It made me angry to think that someone's selfish actions had um, added an extra two miles to my route. That said, the path through the estate is beautiful, though slightly marred by the numerous signs reminding people to keep to the path. I was relieved to find the river at the bottom again, where the path continues close to it across green pastures for another, miles to, another couple of miles to Hurley Riverside Park and Hurley Lock, a series of small islands in the middle of the river. Further on was another crossing at Temple Lock that took me across Weirs to get to the other side, where the Thames path continued close to the river's end, edge onto Marlow. About a mile before, I noticed a distinctive old church on the other side of the bank at Bisham, which dates to, back to the 12th century. As I approached Marlow, the path got busier in both directions. The first park goes through a couple of green parks and takes you into the town itself, which is very pretty, and also known for a, a 19th century suspension bridge. I was diverted inland and underneath it, where initially the signs were quite clear until they disappeared. I was taken around the back of the church, where I should have been joined the river shortly afterwards. However, I kept seeing private no-access signs near exclusive properties. I asked someone of a small boy who seemed local if he knew I could rejoin the path. He gave me a number of possibilities, but it was a familiar story of going down private roads to find a path that, to try and find a path that rejoined the river. From here, the route stuck close to the river along the woodland and meadows before it reached the railway and crossing at Bourne End. This last mile, as I approached Cookham, seemed to go very quickly. I could see the bridge ahead of me, which gave me a focus point, and I was intending to stop close to it. The ferry pub was just as good a place as any, and across the road from the church where the artist Stanley Spencer is buried. Monday 7th of June 2021, day 8, Cookham to Leyland. The first part out of Cookham was a diversion inland for a mile. I thought I could use an alternative path closer to the river, but this turned out to be the grounds of a private club. The route led me through cool woodland, and I was soon back onto the banks of the river. The next couple of miles toward Maidenhead were straightforward, through green fields and woodland, and then alongside a main road. As I entered Maidenhead, I had to cross the, over the bridge to the other side, where there was busy traffic. I was pleased to finally make it over to continue my journey. The path was on quite a hard road, slightly away from the river behind private gardens, but soon wove its way through trees for quite a while until, at about six miles, Dorney Lake runs parallel to the river. This is a purpose-built rowing lake, privately owned and financed by Eton College. It must be over a mile long. I managed to catch a glimpse of some trees after mile seven. I passed a small open chapel on my left, the Chapel of St Mary Magdalene at Boveney, a redundant chapel, distinctive for its wooden spire. At Boveney Lock, the path continues through more trees and open pastures, directly opposite Windsor Race Falls. I crossed more open meadows and woodland before reaching Eton where I had to cross through the town and back um, and the bridge to the other side into Windsor territory. The view of Windsor Castle ahead of me was spectacular as I approached. Approach. I thought I could follow an alternative route close to the river about a mile further on. However, after a short diversion, I realised that the alternative route was the grounds of Windsor Castle. The official Thames path was not unpleasant and wound its way through a leafy route where you could see across to the castle grounds on the other side. There was a short diversion before reaching Albert Bridge, presumably named after the Royal, where I had to cross back again to the other side. As I approached mile 15, it must have been tiredness that made me a little less careful in picking up my feet, and I fell over. Luckily, it was only superficial and nothing was damaged. I dusted myself off before continuing. I passed through Runnymede, the home of Magna, the Magna Carta. The town is quite sprawling and stretches some distance, initially through a quite green approach, where there were people parked, to enjoy, parked up to enjoy the riverside, and then through the pleasure ground, a boat yard, riverside cottages, and the grand-looking Runnymede Hotel and Spa, right next to Runnymede Bridge, also the M25 London Orbital. I ran underneath this double bridge as I tried to get close to the bridge I wanted to cross at Staines. What was less than a mile away seemed much longer. This last stretch was the home straight to my stopping point at Leyland. I was tired and couldn't see an end to it. I spotted what I thought was my partner in the distance. A voice from behind me call, called me and confirmed it was indeed him, come to encourage me in my final steps. 
It was appreciated, but did little to make the last few strides any easier. Finally, I arrived at the stopping point at South Laleham, where I'll resume my journey to Richmond tomorrow. Tuesday, 8th of June 2021, day 9, Leyland to Richmond. Today was a convenient start as the campsite I was staying in was just across the road. The first three or, three or so miles were very close to the river, along shady paths with trees providing much needed heat, shade from the heat. There was also a slight breeze. As I approached Shepperton, there were two choices. Either take the ferry across, to the across the water to continue on the path to the other side, or take the alternative route completely on dry land. I opted for the, la for the latter, which seemed more authentic, but took me inland for a bit, around the closed gates of the private sailing club that could have kept me close to the river, and then through Shepperton, before reverting down a wooded area back to the river. This seemed straightforward until I lost the path through the wood and ended up at a dead end. I had to retrace my steps back up to rejoin a road that went around the top of the wood and through Halliford, where there were closed gates to private residences and an inaccessible meadow denying any access. The route eventually joined the Thames at the end of the road at the quite spectacular modern Walton Bridge. The bridge, as its name um, predicts, takes you to Walton upon the Thames on the other side. This stretch is quite far along the river, along tree lined paths for at least three miles until the water treatment works alongside Mosley Reservoir and, and the Nature Reserve. Sadly, I couldn't catch a glimpse of the latter. Trees continued to line my path until I reached Hurst Point and Meadows, which opened out into the heat of the sun. I was aware of a niggling low back pain every time I stopped, and I was starting to wonder whether I would make it all the way to Richmond. But I crossed Hampton Court Bridge when I reached it and persevered in my journey. The three-mile stretch to Kingston Bridge would normally be a relatively easy run on flattest ground directly alongside the river. Today, at miles 11 to 14, it seemed somewhat more arduous. After crossing the bridge at Kingston, I knew I only had about four miles to go. After a short stretch along a road beside the river, the path was woody and tree-lined until Teddington Lock and Weir, and then re-entered the welcome shade of a tree-lined path again. Every now and then I found a spot to dip my running hat into the river to cool me down, a strategy I found very helpful these last few warm days. The last stretch wound its way past Ham House and Gardens, though you couldn't really see them from the path. From this point I knew I didn't have much further to go. The path opened up, opened through Petersham Meadows at mile 17, which meant only a mile to go. As the river looped a bit, a bit to the left, I saw Richmond Bridge in the distance and a number of outdoor cafes that I knew would provide welcome relief once I'd stopped. Wednesday night for June 2021, day 10, Richmond to Waterloo. This wasn't a bad run, much of it was along shaded paths as far as Barnes Bridge and there was also a slight breeze which always helps. These first few miles felt steady and I enjoyed the leafy coolness of the trees. I passed the deer park at Richmond and the gardens at Kew, though I couldn't actually see into them. I caught glimpses of, of rowers training in the river and also passed rowing clubs every now and then. The path rose gradually to a much higher level, which gave an interesting viewpoint looking down at the river. One of my students had said she might come out and cheer me, cheer me on at, near Kew. Sometime after I passed the loop of the river towards Mortlake, I heard a voice behind me and it was her on her bike. She cycled behind me as I continued running and we chatted for a bit until I reached Barnes Bridge, where we went our separate ways. I was very touched by this gesture and it distracted me for a while from the more difficult aspects of running. At around five miles I was still not too far into the run, things were still relatively comfortable. Though running along the open wall, edging the river through Barnes, I felt the heat of the day. This didn't last too long and the path was soon along shaded trees again as it wound its way round another loop of the river towards Hammersmith Bridge and London Wetlands. From there it wasn't too far to Putney where you come out into a line of rowing clubs and into Putney itself. I knew this would be where there would be potential diversions. I was initially diverted round a church and back onto the riverside briefly and around some new riverside de developments but it wasn't too long before I was back along alongside the river heading towards Wandsworth Bridge. 
From here it was out in the open sun, running mainly past riverside developments until Battersea Park, which was a welcome relief. I knew that from this point it would only be four miles to Waterloo. These last few miles were a real struggle, and by then the heat of the day had got to me. I decided to stay on the south side of the river, despite the diversion at Battersea Power Station. Even though I'm not a fan of this new development, much of the path near to the river has started to open up there. Back on the river is only a short stretch to Vauxhall Bridge, where there is a short diversion blocking the river path at the bridge on the south end, possibly due to the London Tideway super sewer that is blocking off so many parts of the Thames Path at the moment. Reaching the walkway opposite the Houses of the Parliament and outside the Thames Hospital, I knew I only had a mile and a half to go. I was dreading having to weave my way through tourists and people around the London Eye and South Bank, but it wasn't quite as bad as I thought. Trees along the walkway by the National Theatre provided a welcome shade. Perhaps it was also the thought of finishing that made it all the more pleasurable. Thursday 10th of June, day 11, Waterloo to Belvedere. The first part of the route kept close to the river, past familiar sites, including the Oxo Tower, Tate Modern, the Globe Theatre, until Clink Street, Clink Street, just before London Bridge, where it diverted around South Southwark Cathedral until after London Bridge Station, where it was possible to cut in just before Hayes Galleria and rejoin the river on the section that leads to Tower Bridge. At this time of the day, it was too early for there to be any mini tourists, so there was plenty of space. The path is more fiddly around Bermondsey and Rotherhive as it weeds in and out of short sections close to the river and other areas where access is closed off. A, a short section came back onto the riverside before the approach to Deptford, where I passed Sorry Dock Farm before the route went inland again, and then made a more extended diversion at Peeps Park through Deptford for a good mile or so before rejoining the riverside close to Greenwich. The other side of Deptford to Greenwich is much more accessible, and from there to the Thames Barrier is very straightforward. It keeps very close to, um, to the river and past the beautiful old naval college, now Trinity School of Music in Greenwich University, and later the Millennium Dome and Village, Greenwich, Greenwich Peninsula Development, Ravensbourne University and the Emirates Cable Car Crossing. There are small detours around the back of the Trafalgar pub at Greenwich, a mixed concrete site towards mile nine, and later around the back of Greenwich Yacht Club, just before mile 11. A short section came back onto the river, and then another detour around the back of some small industries and the Hope and Anchor pub, after which it was a straight run to the Thames Barrier. The approach to this is visible in the distance, at least a mile ahead, at 12 mi at, at mile ahead. At 12 miles, it's also marked a significant point, with only five miles to go. A short path took me down some steps and through a tunnel back next to the river, before another detour past the cafe and the Thames Side Studio Complex. Whilst this is a bit of a nuisance, it's much shorter and better than it used to be. A new section of River Path has opened up just around the corner from the studios, which takes you straight through to Woolwich. It should have been a straight path along the Woolwich Ferry Terminal, except for another detour along the busy A206 due to a new development. Luckily, this it wasn't too long. Back on the riverside, it was, much more, it was more or less an un uninterrupted path to my destination. This section through Woolwich to where the river, where the river widens is my favourite part of the journey um, and is part of the new Thames Park extension. It looks quite rugged and desolate, but is well maintained and includes green areas such as Plumstead marshes alongside houses and parks. It's also a popular area for anglers. As I passed through, I was starting to struggle, as I normally do, over the last few miles, but it helped to be in such an amazing part of outer London. My journey ended at the site of the old pumping station, just before Costness Sewage Treatment Works at Belvedere. This wasn't so much by design as practicality, as the Ridgeway Path exit was the easiest way out, and would be the easiest way back in tomorrow. Friday 11th of June 2021, day 12, Belvedere to North Fleet. I regretted ending last night's section just before the sewage treatment plant at Belvedere. Apart from the aesthetics of the old brick pump house museum at the start, the smell soon became unbearable, and I had to hold my breath until I'd passed on the way to Erith. To begin with, the river was walls high, so you couldn't see much over it, but as it continued, it was possible to see the widening estuary. 
It was bleak and desolate, with little greenery and increasingly industrial. I was heading towards Crayford Ness, one of the few salt marshes in Great Britain. It's also where the Thames Path extension ends. The path, the path through was stony and away, from the, and away from the edge of the river, but the rugged, grassy view of the marsh was beautiful. The path led to an extended diversion about five and a half miles, which is marked by a huge metal recycling plant that leads you to the tributary river, Darrant, and the imposing dark creek flood barrier leading south. Since there is no bridge, there is no choice but to divert down and back up the other side. It was a frustrating six mile diversion in the heat of the day, and whilst the path along the River Darrant was pleasantly dramatic, the industrial estate, busy your carriageway and bridge you have to cross to get to the other side were not. However, knowing I'd be approaching mile 11 at the top spurred me on. Back at the top, I was not, it was not too far to the Queen Elizabeth II bridge. It was breathtaking to pass below it, um, but I also noticed a small makeshift memorial to three small boys underneath it near to the river, presumably drowned. The route, be the route beyond leading to Greenhive was bare and stony, but gave a good open view of the widening river. And it, but it led to another diversion around more ri riverside industries and a huge Asda. I was momentarily disoriented, but I remembered from the map I had consulted numerous times that I would need to head left along the busy road for about a mile and a half before rejoining the river. It wasn't very pleasant in the dry, dusty heat of the day, and I was also starting to tire. Here the path is to lead to another salt marsh at Broad Ness, north of Swanscombe, and close to my destination at Northfleet. To begin with, it ran close to the river, but just as I was reaching the tip, every path that could have led there was preceded with aggressive, red, no-entry private land signs. This cut off quite a chunk of what some Swanscombe marshes, a nature reserve itself, and led me directly to a huge industrial estate where there was no access and the only way was to go round it. I got lost and I asked a truck driver how I would get back to the river. He told me that I was already very close to Northfleet, that if I continued round and turned left at a set of traffic lights I could get back to the water's edge. It was quite a detour and I didn't really know where I was going, but I was reassured that I was close to the end of my journey. The path wound its way round to another, more open, dusty construction site, which had a strange pedestrian footpath going straight through it. You could just about see the river through the dusty work and detritus as I continued along this footpath. My journey ended at a very short section at the water's edge, ironically called the shore. This is where I'll start again tomorrow. Saturday 12th of June 2021, day 13, North Fleet to All Hallows. It was cloudy, almost overcast, with a light breeze, and it was not set to hit 25 degrees until later in the afternoon. The road took me round into some industrial estates, and I found myself heading towards a work no go area. I turned back to find another route, when a man approached me to say I shouldn't be there. I told him I realised that, and that's why I'd turned back. It was not a good start, as I tried to work out a route into Gravesend I'd not planned. When I finally reached the riverside again, I ran along a wooden walkway past some flats that led into the town and kept to the riverfront. I passed the ferry terminal where you can take a ferry to Tilbury on the other side of the river. Then the statue of Pocahontas and the distinctive bright red LV-21, an old light ves lighthouse vessel converted into an art space. A slight detour took me to the, uh, to the Royal Pier Road in the back of the Port of London Authority building, up and down another road. It wasn't long before I reached the rowing club, and it was onto the promenade. However, this didn't last long before I had to weave my way through some industrial units, where I got a little disoriented. I found a narrow path leading back to the riverside via the Ship and Lobster pub. I couldn't see much for a while due to the river wall. It was soon out on the grassy ridge by the East Court marshes, looking out at the estuary. This section is beautifully green and rugged for about two or three miles. It passes some interesting sights through a former police training centre and an old ruined fort. Further on, I ran into some beautiful piebald ponies and their foals who were grazing on the land. The, the path, which to begin with, is both the Saxon, Saxon Shore Way and the Hoo Peninsula Path, carried on straightforwardly, and it felt a privilege to be out on my own in this vast green and rugged landscape. It was amazingly quiet except for the wildlife. The path was a little uneven, but not too bad for running on. 
I tried to keep as close to the river as I could and found myself on slightly more precarious land, which I realised afterwards must have been one of the larger pools at Cliff. It was here I took a wrong turning and instead of continuing onto the path around the edge of the river towards Cliff Fort, I'd somehow followed another path inland, past an aggregate site and found myself on a road with a few farmhouses. It was too far to turn back and for a moment I thought I was lost. I didn't know how, but I found my way back to another part of the cliff pools and had to work out how to find a path back to the river. There were a few people about, and it was a mixture of asking different people and instincts that put me back on the right path. This followed a high river wall, presumably in flood defence, since the landscape is marshy. Although it followed the edge of the river closely, the wall was high and the footpath much lower, so I couldn't see the estuary for much of the time. There was a grass verge, but it was quite steep and overgrown so impossible to run or walk on easily. Later, a narrow path appeared in the grass at the top for a while next to the wall, then dropped down further below. Eventually, there was a more consistent path in the a kind of ridge that gave a more open view. It was an amazing view on both sides, with the estuary on one side and the marshy landscape on the other. It wasn't too hard to run on and was beautifully barren, but it was also relentless. After a while, in the heat of the sun and in only, with only a slight, slight breeze, it felt endless. I wasn't lost, but I had somehow lost all sense of place. I was eager to reach my destination, but there were no real landmarks to work out how far I'd to go, other than what the tracking app on my mobile phone was telling me. I expected to continue on the edge of the river, but at some point around mile 13, the coastal path diverted inland onto a dry stony path where there was even less breeze. I felt disoriented. Once back up in the river's edge, the, the last five, five miles were more consistent and worth the pain. The view out to the estuary was spectacular and starting to look more sea-like. The ground was soft and grassy and not too hard going, but still a struggle as I was starting to fatigue and reach my limit. I was pleased to see a few more people appear, enjoying the good weather. I saw my destination, the caravan park at All Hallows, appear in the distance. However, I could tell that it was still another two or three miles away. It seemed as if I was never going to get there. But it was worth the agony for the experience of being right on the edge of this ever-widening river, as it really starts to meet the sea. Just as I was approaching, the route diverted in again, due to some marshland. But it wasn't long before I started to pass row upon row of static caravans on my right as I reached the entrance of the caravan park. I was a bit disoriented and I realised that I missed the small path to the riverfront. I spotted my partner in the distance waiting for me and turned back to, make the small, to take the small path to meet him on the corner. Sunday 30th of June 2021, day 14, All Hallows to the Isle of Grey. I started the run I finished the day before at the corner of the riverfront, right outside All Hallows Haven Holiday Park. Part cultish, part stepford wives, these almost identical static holiday homes stretch out across the estuary coastline for almost a mile, and the public footpath goes right through it. Through it. it was already quite hot with only a very light breeze, so I was pleased that this would only be a short run. The path out of the holiday park veered left directly onto the edge of the coastline. It was grassy and soft underfoot, and I had the same sensation here more than ever, that I was heading to the, end of, to the end of the estuary, out to the sea, or to the end of the world. It was quiet, and it didn't seem to, there didn't seem to be anybody else about. The tide was right out, and it felt open and free from this slightly undulating path that didn't change too much for a couple of miles. I knew that soon I would have to head inland at Yanclit Creek to actually get to the Isle of Grain. The marker for this um, is, uh, was the London Stone that I spotted in the distance I approach. This granite obelisk shaped stone, dating back to 1856, marks the eastern boundary of the City of London's Conservancy jurisdiction in the south bank of the river. You could say it is this that marks the boundary where the river meets the sea. Unfortunately, I couldn't get close to it, as it was on the mudflat on the other side of the creek. I carried on down the path by the creek. By the creek. This historically separated the Isle of Grain from the mainland, hence, its, hence the name, but it's silted up and now drains the, isle, the area of the Isle of Grain and the All Hallows marshes. Although I was heading inland, it was pretty spectacular. Again, even though I, I kind of knew where I was heading, I had a bit of a sense of the unknown for a couple of miles. 
I would have liked to have carried on up the other side of the creek, back up to the coastline, but I was met with very clear, private, no entry signs. A large danger sign behind a high wire fence also warned that, that the area was a former military firing, firing range. I continued on the path of land through some fields towards the village. As I approached, a distinctive refinery and power station were visible to my right, and it wasn't too long before too long before I reached the road that would take me into the village. I thought I'd be able to act as a path through a higher point of the coastline, but I couldn't find it, and I ended up keeping to the most direct path on the road. This took me into a small high street past the co-op, pub and church, where there were only two possible way throughs to the coast. To the coast. As I reached it, it didn't even feel that I'd come to the edge of the sea. I continued left up the path where I was met with the barrier, which I thought was just as good a place as any to stop. The, the, the tide was still well out and the panoramic view was amazing. What, an, a way, um, what a way to end this epic journey. So it's been an amazing adventure and one I couldn't have done without the support of my partner, Richard Allen, um, who saw me off each morning, came to meet me at the end of my run each day. In between, he drove the camper van to places we stayed, checked out the locations and facilities, bought provisions, took me on recuperating walks, calmed me down when emotionally exhausted, and when challenged by technology, and gave me foot massages when needed. This is a, a great experience to share, and I couldn't have done it without you, nor I, nor I trusted Hyde Campervan, Nolan. So, and thank you. This is the end of the talk. Thank you. Okay. This, I just stopped sharing, so... Um, yeah, sorry, it went on a little bit longer because of the technical hitches at the beginning. Um, I had, when I timed it, it was 50 minutes. So, <laughs> um, so I'd love to, um, if anyone's got any questions or statements or, you know, start a, a little conversation if you'd like to. Um, anyone want to start us off? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for inter your attentiveness as well. <laughs> I hope you're not falling. Well, maybe maybe it did send you to sleep because it's like kind of you know bedtime story. Maybe. <laughs> I have I have a question. Yes. Um, you've you've mentioned well. You mentioned right at the beginning that running isn't actually something that you really enjoy and that it's a bit of a struggle and a challenge. And then throughout the blog post, there's a lot of the highlighting of <clears throat> fatigue and you know the worry of the dangers and all sorts of things related to the running and I'm wondering how how important is that to you in terms of your practice that you kind of are you trying to overcome that is it just an aside that you have to push through um yeah yeah I mean, what I think, yeah I never thought I could run I mean it's, it's um I mean I never started running I was never running before I started making using it as part of my art practice and that was a means to extend other things I'd done uh, using my own body so I was sort of on the one hand I was sort of trying to s strip things back to kind of a simple activity on the other hand I said it's not so simple because it's something I, um, I would never have seen myself running distances like that for instance but then it's not you know and I'm very and very careful to say it's not competitive so I'm not running fast I'm still running I mean the durational element yes it is something that I'm quite interested in and also this sort of unknowingness about it I don't know necessarily if I can re if I'm going to reach the end of, of, of my journey. I hope I will, but there is always a sense of uncertainty because of that. Mm. Does that sort of answer your question? <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks, um, Ian. <laughs> Did you want to add to that? I suppose I actually feel like I've run 250 miles with you. That was exhausting. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's, I actually I struggled to hear it a bit. I've got my hearing aids in. Um, yeah. So it was a case that I was putting them in, taking them out, putting them in. And, um, but yeah, I mean, it was pretty impressive. Um, I used to run. I used to run five miles a day and, and I was exhausted. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, it was good. It was really good. I enjoyed it. Thank you. So and that's what I was sort of trying to do with this, is to take you on this journey, you know, yeah. the narrative of it. 
Um, and it was a real struggle as well, not only the running, but just to write something at the end of each day. But I made myself do it because I knew I would forget a lot of it. I mean, I probably wouldn't have, you know, and um, and even, you know, even when I really wanted to sleep, I just made myself write this blog because, yeah, even from one day to the next, there's so much you, you forget. Um, and, and I just wanted to sort of have this kind of account that, you know, that was had been really important. Um, because you're lost in your thoughts. When you're on your own, you're also lost in your thoughts. And there's, you know, no one else to, you know, talk to apart from, you know, I was probably heard, I think there was a little, a little bit of swearing on the, the section, I didn't realise. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, you just, you know, talked to myself a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm sure. Um, I was going to say something there, I forgot what the heck it is. Too many glasses of wine while I'm watching, Veronique. <laughs> I didn't, I mean, I, but, but I, I did enjoy it. Thank you. I did. I did see people. I mean, there were some bits where I felt really alone, and other bits where you know, where places were busier. You did see people, and you know, sometimes people would say hello to you. Sometimes they wouldn't. Um, and um, someone stopped me. Not stopped me. I asked the wait somewhere from somebody, and he asked me what I was doing. And then he said he thought I was he thought I was a policewoman because I was wearing all this gadget gadgetry, <laughs> which I thought was quite amusing. <laughs> yeah, and no, I can imagine. Sorry, I turned it on because you realised you're probably sitting talking to a whole bunch of empty screens. Right, I recognise your voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, even even just reading that for that amount of time, I actually thought that was really impressive. Well, I was struggling towards the end. I'm, I, I should have got a glass of water. I realised I should have had a glass of water and I didn't. So, um, so yeah, I should have had that because, I, yeah, I did stumble over some words a little bit, particularly towards the end. <laughs> yeah, no, well, well done. Well done. I'll look forward to see your, um, I know you are doing the, the whole phone thing and I can see behind you. Well, uh, yeah, the view behind me, that's why I put it up, the view behind me for... But, you know, for benefit of everybody, I just thought I'd, put, I'd have that as a backdrop. It's something I'm trying to work on at the moment as a kind of installation. So it's I've got an, about an eight metre map and drawing um, that lines my studio. And then I've got the pages of the blog at different intervals. And then I've managed to get recycled mobile phones to use as media players to play footage that I recorded on Facebook. Um, so you always get this kind of cacophony of sound. I mean, it's just trying to work things out in the studio at the moment. Hopefully, eventually, I'll show it somewhere when I feel it's ready <laughs> at the moment. It looks, it, it looks pretty uh, finished in the background there with the photographs and all printed out. Well, there's, there's, well that's just a section. <laughs> I've got, there's 14, okay, they, I've got 14 phones and 14, yeah, there's 14 sec to represent the 14 sections. So yeah, they're a little bit fiddly to work with because a lot of them are kind of quite out of date. I was trying to keep costs low, so they all had to be on yeah. the grid. <laughs> so. Excellent. Well, listen, well done anyway. It's Thank very you. impressive. Like I said, it's nice to see a mixture of people. Like Some people I know, some people I don't know, some people I've taught, some people I haven't. <laughs> so it's a really nice mix of audience. That's great. Some family as well, my brother's here. And, um, uh, my family just avoid me on my mother's here, which is really lovely. So, um, Veronique, so yeah. I, my name's Janice. Oh, so, hi. I've been following your work. I work at Oxford Brooks University. I'm oh, a hello. Senior I work on the MFA as well. Oh, um, and uh, I use running in my work as well quite a bit, and I strap cameras to myself. So, I found it just mesmerizing thank you and, and i haven't run for about a month and it yeah. made me just want to get up and run <laughs> and actually i'm i run in the chiltern hills so i run across flint fields ah. so, and i know all the areas that well i know a lot of the areas that you're talking about yeah, yeah and i'm quite interested in that relationship to the ground and trying to keep yourself steady and on track yeah well i was trying to um, get a sense of that with what I, what I was writing about so that it was really about that experience of what i could feel underfoot because it really did yeah. vary, obviously and um so um yeah it wasn't always it wasn't always easy yeah <laughs> sorry my camera's not working either i don't oh, know that's okay but I, just, I just wondered i know when i've run and particularly run through um forests out here when when and i've, I've done um, sort of, you know, 10k races. I'm not, I mean, I'm the same as you. I've run a marathon, but I wouldn't call myself a, I'm not a competitive runner. No, well, I'm, so I'm not a competitive runner either. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the older I'm getting, the worse I'm getting. But I just wondered, um, do you ever get a runner's high when you're running? Yeah. Or are you focusing too much? 
No, I do. No, there are. That's why I tried to say. I tried to say bits that I found pleasurable. That you know, there is a, you know that kind of sensation, like when there's breeze on your, you know, or just being at, you know, it was really particular. It was a particularly. We had a really late spring, so there was so much around me. You know, it felt like the. I don't know. It's a bit cliched, really. I suppose, but you know, <laughs> with all the sort of. Um, the wildlife and the young um, chicks and you know, that you kept seeing everywhere and it just felt really I you know I wasn't at work it, it actually sort of it was, took my you know my mind away from the stress even though it was something I was doing that was difficult it took my mind away from my normal stresses that I have to deal with when I'm working um, so yeah. um, so those are part of the pleasures and yes you so, some of that kind of getting lost or you find your mind you, your mind drifting sometimes yeah. Um, but then some then, then then you sort of have to bring it back because that's when if my mind drifts too much and I don't look where I'm putting my feet I might fall over yeah <laughs> I have done <laughs> so, so you get that sense of, from, from the presentation that you did as well which is kind of like a performance in itself you get that sense of a flow and and even from the the scroll you know the idea of the scroll that you're reading. yeah well I, I sort of that was a bit of an experiment I was just sort of putting the pages out for, for the for the this sort of installation, and I thought I want, you know, quite like to do this this way, you know, here as well. And I don't really like reading things on screen very much anyway. So it's just sort of, you know, trying to grapple, you know, also grapple with the with the um, uh, the size of the scroll as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is kind of the, the sort of parallels to the size of the run, isn't there? The, yeah, the, yeah. The duration <laughs> of the run and uh, yeah, the, yeah. Oh um, no, well, I'd be really interested to hear more about your um, your work actually. Yeah, so do. Yeah, I've just. Much. just finished a PhD and it, it includes a little bit of it so okay great maybe, um, yeah I might try and publish something <laughs> I will do because I'm trying to so um, and I noticed David David Sidley here is here <laughs> hello David um, who um, we um, sort of well we did a, a kind of symposium earlier this year around um, running art um, running artfully um, which is something we've been pursuing for quite a while. We've been trying to find other artists or con connect with other artists who yeah. use running within their their work as art. So it's not in the sort of social sciences way where there's loads of, you know, but, you know, as art, there's very little. And um, so that was really interesting. We had about 20 yeah, artists. I attended that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Right. Yeah. It was really good. Really. And, um, but we're looking to try and put, you know, the next step would be to try and put something together, like some kind of, creative anthology or something mm. you know so um you know i just need to find the way right way and of doing it and fund, mm. probably some funding uh, but uh, it'd be nice to take it forward you know after having had that and to involve other people as well so. that was great thank you really good <sighs> any other any other yeah can i ask a question please Ronnie? yeah of course um thank you um yeah it was really good to watch it happening live, obviously, um, you know, over the summer on Facebook and yeah. stuff. Um, how did you feel afterwards, you know, in the days following? Because obviously you're doing this action for day after day after day. And then how did you feel afterwards, if you don't mind? It's strange because you sort of, I suppose, a bit, it's a bit of a... Um... Well, some of it, I mean, on a physical level, sort of like a muscle memory. So your feet are sort of wanting to run in a strange way because you've got that momentum of doing that. And I had this pattern of of running and sort of in the mo mostly early part, earlier part of the day and finishing sort of early afternoon, then having this stretch of time which would be like to try and recuperate. And then, um, and so, yeah, that felt strange not having that, having done it for 14 days and then, um, but yeah, it's slightly anticlimax in some ways, of course, because it was, you know, it, it was, it's just felt like an adventure. And um, so, um, so yeah, that was, the, that was the sort of, I suppose it's a bit of a downside, just ple but pleased to that it went as well as it could have done really for me. And I was really pleased about that part of it because it's not something I can repeat. So I might be able to repeat it in different ways, but I said, you know, I'm not going to repeat that journey again. So, you know, so if, I don't know, um, it didn't matter, there will always be, bit, you know, I've got fragments of video footage, it's not necessarily continuous, and that's part of the way you work with technology, and that says a lot about technology as well in itself. So, um, but I was amazed at how much I did manage to sort of gather and to, you know, um, so there's, I've got a lot of things I can work with subsequently that won't be the same, but will go into other things, yeah, so. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah.
So. Veronique, there's a question from Katie in the chat box um, asking, would you talk more about the meditative effects? Ah, meditative effects. And um, there's a comment saying the sound and the rhythm of your breath is quite powerful. And I'm going to add, add my own question onto that, if that's okay. Um, when you were saying um, in the last stretch of the run that you, in, in, in the flats that you become quite disorientated and couldn't quite place where you're at, are, are those meditative effects something that you can maybe tap into to, is that something that you can do? It certainly is, because I mean, what I found aside from what I do it do for um, for my work, but it's obviously I have to train anyway. So running is a big part of my life now anyway, because I have to keep fit. And if, when I'm running, um, when I'm training for these kinds of things, I, I do a little bit more. But but I I do find it's particularly in the last you know eighteen months of during the pandemic, you know, it really was really important to go out and run and to get because it was very stressful always been very stressful so that kind of meditative sort of being able to just sort of um wash away the days kind of you know worries a bit for for a time i really felt it when when i couldn't go out it was very frustrating when i couldn't go out and would get very sort of you know sometimes upset if i said there was something preventing me from going out to running so that you know that is really important and it, it, that drifting and that meditation is 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 yeah it, it is it is important there's a big part of it <laughs> and uh, and i think the really yeah, i'm very aware of my breathing when i'm doing it and i sometimes have to bring my breathing into a certain rhythm to make sure that you know i don't know is it, is it i'm breathing properly or i'm maintaining a certain sort of pattern with my breath so and that's quite meditative as well of course um Sarah, I've got a question for you. It's Helen. Oh, hi, Helen. Hello, hello. I really enjoyed that. Um, I was just wondering about your, how you, I know somebody earlier talked about the contact with the ground, and I was wondering if, if you could talk about what, do you feel that your presence as you move through that landscape, what, what is that doing? Are you in some way, because I know that you mentioned um, you pointed out where there was restricted access or where people owned land or claimed land. And I wondered if you were in the process of reclaiming or tracing in some way that land for some purpose. That's a really nice thought, actually, because I do, I mean, I feel strongly about those things when I see them and I, I you know, I kind of react to them. And, you know, obviously these extracts, I probably went into more detail in the blog itself about how, annoyed, how frustrated I would get with those things. But, um, but there is this other sense. So it's interesting what you're saying about sort of feeling, you know, feeling the, you know, um, and um, so not just well emotionally, but also um, you know feeling things underfoot, and also um, what was, was going to say? Um, um, I was lost my thread a minute, but um, but yeah, um, it, 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 there is a sense of. Um, um, I wanted to. Yeah, I just forgotten what I was going to say. Sorry. <laughs> I wondered if you were in some way claiming the land or tracing it as a way of sort of pulling it back into a more collective space, or I don't know. So I just wondered what there was a, if there was an action there. No, I think I think I think you are right. It's not something I've really uh, dwelled upon that much yet, but it's something I do have thought about. C certainly, I'd have reclaimed on the way I sort of think about the idea of negotiating landscape or carving up my own path through. And then, you know, other times I, you know, that's why I'm sort of sometimes I quite like to maybe disobey rules without damaging anything. But in this case, there were usually, I mean, I was very pleased to have the Thames Path signs because they were actually, you know, there was usually pretty good reasons why they were there. Um, but, um, um, and sometimes they were, you know, quite often they were as, me as much geographical as, as for other reasons. But, um, but yeah, I do like that idea of reclaiming because offence. There's a sense. Oh, I know what it's going to say. And I'm going to say it in a minute. Um, um, yeah, there's a there's a sense that is, um, I don't know when you're on your own as well, and and you're making your own decisions and your own path. You know, covering your own path through. And um, and and then there was um, uh, there was also um, yeah. When I, I think it's to do with the difference for me, for me between running and walking, and people who are into walking might dispute this. I, it's just for me, you know, my own experience, why I'm, you know, running is so particular to me, is that I sort of um, feel when I'm running that I'm in it, 
that I'm immersed in it. I'm, um, it whereas I, in, I have the sense more when I'm walking that I'm more of an external observer in some way. I have a much more powerful sense of being in it when I'm running. But that's just me. That's just maybe, maybe, maybe other people have different experiences. Yeah. Which I think relates to what you're saying, Helen, a little bit. Well, you still there? <laughs> me? Oh, yes. No, thank you. <laughs> Very interesting. No, it's interesting. Interesting. I was just thinking when you were saying about running and walking about, you know, you're hitting the ground, aren't you, when you're, you know, it's much more forceful, that it's, interaction. It's more forceful, yeah, in that sense. But there is also, I think it's to do with, the, the you know, the, the rhythm or something, or, pop, you know, passing through, passing, being in, passing through it. For, mm. Um, um, that, that I have the sensation of. Um, mm. uh, it doesn't mean that walking isn't valid and, uh, you know, found myself, no, no. you know, at, at all, but, um, but there's something, you know, that running is, is a different, you know, different kind of, yeah, have a different rhythm for me. Um, that is something to do with what you're talking about, I think. <clears throat> Anything, any, I'm more mindful of time, but um, is any, anyone, anyone? Want well, to... I was just, I have a... can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, uh, Isela. Um, no, I was just thinking now, this friend of Frodo, what uh, Ellen just was saying, you know, it came into my mind, your work um, at Morley Gallery, when you been, were running on a treadmill mm. for a very long time, and kind of, uh, I can't remember how long that was, but it was a very long time. And, um, and obviously this experience of running outside, I mean, obviously there is this sense of, uh, I mean, the difference to me, the way I see the difference between running and walking is that when, I mean, I don't know if it's to do just with running, but whenever you push the body, mm. um, you know, in, in a physical endeavor that kind of stretch yeah. is, is, where, is where you need to be in it, isn't it? Yeah. There is, well, yeah. I think, well, yeah, and that relates to what I, I spend, what I'm interested in, in, in uh, talk about is the level of difficulty. It's not, I mean, it's not that, you know, walking can be difficult if you're walking a lot of miles, of course, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there is more difficulty more generally, you know, because I find running difficult, but uh, that's what I mean. Yeah. In exploring yeah. and in pushing myself. Yeah, and yeah, that's what I was saying. I was getting at the, the, the fact that you now run, you know, this running outdoor, but you, you know, you really need to create your own path. You don't, in this sense of unknown, mm. for which way you're going to go. I mean, there is, yeah, you know, it's, it's very different from a running on a treadmill, isn't it? it yeah, of, well, that's what I did. It was interesting. Yeah. I mean, the, the piece of work that Rosella is referring to. Is quite an old piece of work now, but I, I I did this kind of performance in the window of an art gallery on a treadmill, and I was trying to recreate a ten kilometer run, but on a on a manual treadmill. Um, mm -hmm. I actually found, I mean, I chose to do it on a manual treadmill because I wanted it to be as authentic as possible in terms. I didn't want it to be electronic, so the movement of my legs was what powered it, nothing else. Mm. Um, but it was it was actually much more difficult, much more difficult and slower. Mm. And it's really hard work, and mm. um, but um, but yeah, but it was something like that to do in a kind of performative way that I could mm. do, sort of I suppose within a gallery situation. Yeah, but so, so in that case, the relationship, the rela you know, I, I do think that the relationship with with the outdoor and the relationship, you know, I don't know if it is claiming the the land. <laughs> Or it is, or it's just being in the, you know, this direct uh, relationship. Sometimes I, I, I don't know. From the discussion you are making, it feels that the, the relevance is all about the body, but actually I think the land is equally very important. No, I think it does say a lot about the landscape and the land, yeah. and particularly some of the things we think about at the moment environmentally, and yeah. you know, because you, what you see around you. So you know, yeah. it, I mean, right. I was very aware, for instance, as well, of new developments and what that does to the landscape, or, and, and as, well as, as well as to access. Um, and you know, there's lots of controversies around the new the new um, super sewer and things like that. So, um, so yeah, you're aware of all these things. You know, the rivers are big. You know, it's uh, I mean, one part of my interest is is also because I live in London. And the river is such a part of London, or marks the boundary between the north and south. But I knew you little of the you know the other um i knew where it went but it, you know I, I hadn't, in terms of experience i knew little of, of of the other extremities 
So mm. it was a part of a kind of a bit of a discovery for me in that way as well. Um, and, and so it does make you think of envi environmental things as well. Yeah, even it? just the first day of the flooding and when, you know, yeah. it was, uh, yeah, and the... Uh, Yes, I mean, and extreme yeah. heat. You know, you've got, yeah. you've got you know, it's a week before you've got extreme wetness, and then suddenly yeah. you're in almost extreme heat. That was quite yeah. difficult to 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 run in as well, actually. Um, yeah, so. and, and uh, uh, yeah, I think yeah, those moments that resonate with the environment to me become very you know. Sometimes you maybe when you describe that, you, you know, it's almost a they happen by default, uh, isn't it? It's just like a consequence rather than you don't you don't talk about that. That mm. in uh, in your account, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. In, uh, yeah. So that's anyway. kind of and the reason I want to, you know I sort of put this sort of soundtrack on the thing because I kind of I mean Ian's just said it's just running sound effects and breathing it made me think like like I'm doing the run <laughs> which I kind of sort of was trying to sort of take you with me in that sense mm. obviously yeah. you're not doing it but you know just to get I think we have often a an affective mm. sort of relationship when we hear these things because they're very human things and so we kind of identify you know it's quite common sometimes I don't know um if you hear you know for people you know heartbeats to sort of fall into rhythm footsteps to fall into rhythm sometimes you know um mm. kind of on a really fundamental level um so um uh so and, and also with the work itself with the video footage that i was um filming from facebook it's not mm. you know i'm not interested in, fo in filming a view of myself that's not very interesting um i'm, I'm looking outwards at the landscape at the view ahead mm. of me and that's mm. what, where i want to take you as well um mm. And even if you're not there with me, so but I'm taking you with me on my journey, so um, in some way. Yeah, I, I do find your setup behind yourself uh, in the studio very effective. I must say, I, I really enjoy looking at that. I, I kind of um, thank you. You know, it is a very yeah, it's probably a very different way from this the way we experience it today, but... Uh, yeah, and it's very different. It's, 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 yeah. yeah, it just wouldn't have been possible to sort of transfer that onto the screen. They're too small. I did think about doing that, but, you know, one day when I do, when I do, when I, you know, I'll let people know when, I, when it becomes something um, and you can come and see it. <laughs> so um, it does sound well, quite interesting when the... With, the cacophony of sound um you know overlaps and just on repeat um so um but yeah i didn't have a chance to set that up but um yeah thank you emma marcella <laughs> and um yeah nice to see as i said nice to see some of my students ex-students and current students so um, can I have one last question, Veronica? Yeah, of course you can, Sofanka. Uh, I just wanted to ask, do you have a website or is there some some sort of archive where we can see um, your work? Because I, I tend to see always like just one and I haven't really come uh, across I anywhere got where I could... I've got a website. Yeah, I have got a website. It's just phonicchance.com. Um, okay. So okay. there is some of my older yeah. work, probably not this one yet, um, and some bits of older work. It's quite It's quite difficult to recreate of course but there are yeah you probably get some sense of things you know yeah so okay um, thank you <laughs> yeah I, I i came late but uh no that's uh, okay. i'm glad it's, I'm nice to see you here. Here. it's nice to see you here anyway um so yeah thank you and thanks to everybody i've probably kept you unless there's anybody anyone else has any other questions or comments i've probably kept you long enough long enough <laughs> um, i just want to say thank you thank you yeah yeah, it was really good. I've, I've just walked the Thames path from uh, Shoebury and Essap to uh, uh, Oxford. Oh, yes, because I did, I did consider Shoebury. I did explore the other side as well. Yeah. It's just, and I did think about doing the other side, and it was really, you know, um, I'm from Kent, so I sort of decided to do the Kent yeah, side this right. time. Um, there's a lot of, it's quite blocked off from the north side. With, um, I mean, it's nice to see there's loads of industries there. I did an exploratory run last year for, for Totally Thames as well, but shorter um, as a live thing. And um, yeah, there's, there's, there's lots of, there's a lot of the river as you get further and um, is, is quite blocked off until you get round again. Um, yes, that's right. Well, the problem, uh, problem uh, also is you've got the two ports, so you've got to, you have to go quite a way inland to get past the two ports. Sorry. Yeah. Mm. yeah. 
yeah. but the, the rest of it is apart from those two bits the rest of it is is very interesting but your your thing tonight i thought brilliant i really enjoyed it oh good thank you no it's nice to know because you know um as i said there's quite a, there's a few people i know here but it's nice to see there was a quite it was also quite a few people i didn't so it's nice to see it's nice to get that feedback from oh, you know. thank you thank you very much thank you <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. And as I said, I really appreciate that. And, um, you know, watch this space. I will try and, you know, all right. so if anyone does want to see any past work, it's veroniquechance.com is my website, which um, um, yeah, needs updating with this. It's not even got much of this on it yet. <laughs> so um, and also well the, blog, the fuller version of the blog as well, which um, so um, um, it's on the AN blogs, which is artist AN blogs is, um, um, you can Google it, uh, just put it in the chat if you want, um, uh, blogs, if you want to read the full version, and then, um, and the, the link to it will be on my website actually, so, so all the links to do this with this work are on the website. Okay. But enjoy the rest of your evening anyway, and thank you, thank you for coming. Bye. Bye. And nice to meet those of you I hadn't met before. <laughs> bye, bye, Paddy. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. And thanks so much, Kath, for for, for um being behind the scenes. I really appreciated that. <laughs> You're very welcome. I hope it was okay. <laughs> okay, it's, it did, did make me feel a lot less. Okay, so, actually, good. It was, it was really I great. At one thing at a time, so. Yeah. So, anyway, it was nice. Well was done. Like, it was bit great. Of a, bit of an experiment because I hadn't really done that kind of reading kind of thing, you know, uh, before. Or I did do it as a kind of performance once for something else, so I sort of knew I could, you know. Really well, could, yeah yeah it worked really really well it was really good yeah thank you yeah yeah really enjoyed the sound and the visual as well yeah, was, well, yeah. I, I had i had it, thought of trying to do something much more complicated with the visuals i just didn't have time and i just yeah it I wasn't i made this video yeah and i just well i didn't matter it repeats because then you just get a sense of it and then i thought about slowing it down i thought no i don't want to slow down because i want it to be in the rhythm of the run so yeah yeah yeah, yeah it, it worked really well and actually it was nice to repeat things because you could then start identifying where where places were in connection to where the text was. So it was like, oh yeah, oh there, oh yeah, I think that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and then you're like, oh no, that must be near the scene now. Okay, and then and then as like as you kind of went through the journey verbally, then we could like connect to the imagery. It was yeah. nice. It was good. Yeah, it kind of synced. Yeah, I think it synced. Yeah, a bit yeah. at Thank times, which was quite nice. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, enjoy the rest of your evening. You too. You too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a glass of wine. Champagne, yeah. Yeah, yeah, champagne. Which we got the champagne, and Emma's there. Emma, <laughs> as you know, do you know, um, do you know, um, Emma, um, Kath? I don't think Emma so. Is, I was going to.